tēnā tātou, i te tuatahi me mihi atu ki ngā iwi takitake o Wenei Whenua, ki ngā iwi o Yagara, me te iwi o Terrible, ki ngā iwi takitake katoa o Wenei Whenua. He uri tēnei, nō mania poto, nō taranaki, nō ngā rua hine huki, nō Aotearoa hau. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Kia ora. Thank you to um, the organisers of this event, to, to Maureen and to Annette in particular for hosting um, ourselves, um, to my sisters from Okinawa and from Gohan. Uh, it's been a real joy to meet you um, and to all of the other speakers that we've had the privilege of hearing from today, including um, Karina who just spoke, um, Tiana, and to Lisa, uh, and to yes, all the speakers today. Um, it was a real honour. Last night we had the privilege of going to the um, Aboriginal Sovereign Embassy um, and having a fireside corridor there. Um, we met with Bo and, and Auntie Barb, uh, who shared about the history of, of these uh, lands and um, the political struggle and the legacy that we are very much a part of and have benefited from greatly um, in Aotearoa. So I just want to pay my respects to, to those Indigenous lands defenders, uh, human rights defenders. Um, uh, I'm really fortunate in Aotearoa to, um, to be able to learn from our sister, Sina Brown Davis, who, who shares with me often about um, some of the, the history of our, our joint struggles. Um, so, you know, she shared with me some of the, um, the comments of Gary Foley, who identified how Sid Jackson, one of our, um, our preeminent uh, activists from back home, uh, visited here in the in the early 1970s and built really close relationships with radical indigenous activists in Redfern and Brisbane and in Melbourne. Um, there were also very close links, of course, between uh, Ngā Tamatoa in Aotearoa and with the Black Power activists in the 1970s. We were really fortunate that uh, Indigenous Australians came to Aotearoa and participated in our Māori land march um, in the 74-75 period. Um, there's a beautiful photo that Sina shared with me of Gary Foley, Gary Williams, Charlie and Ross Watson, who were members of the tent embassy set up on the, the Australian Parliament grounds in 1972. Um, and that was a tactic that we copied as well to great success. Um, so we appreciate that. Um, we also had Australian Indigenous activists join us in our anti-apartheid uh, protests in 1981 and many, many other examples of, of those joint solidarities. Um, and then also Hilda and Hune Harawera visited here in 1982 to protest the Stolen Wealth Games. And while they were here, they were so inspired by the power of the Aboriginal flag that they saw everywhere. And that prompted them to go home and to start a competition to design a flag to represent the Māori uh, Indigenous sovereignty struggle. And that's where our Tenoranga Tiratanga flag comes from. So, Ngā Mipi Rawatu ki Ngā Iwi Takitake o Ene Thank you. Um, so, as I uh, have come here today to talk about AUKUS, I will do so um, f uh, like in conversation with what I learned um, at that fireside corridor last night. Um, we know, of course, that AUKUS, as, as Tiana mentioned, is a pact between Australia, the UK and the US. Um, and, you know, there are certain members of the Five Eyes Alliance that were left out of that. So. There were a lot of people actually in Canada and New Zealand who felt left out of this of this pact, and um, some some friends of mine and I were joking that if, if Canada, because Canada is thinking about considering joining this pact, we were joking that if they joined, then it would be caucus, and then if New Zealand joined, it would be Caucasians. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now it's just suck us. <laughs> um, which, you know, is just so fitting, isn't it? Because that's exactly what it is. It's a, it's a white settler alliance. Um, and it's all about trying to continue on with this imperial war, world order that we have um, that, that is about these global elites who, who are able to define what the international rules are. So when we talk about the international rules-based order, we're talking about rules that a very select few make and enforce on the rest of the world for their own benefit. So this is very much a response to their weakness 
It's because they feel weak, um, because of uh, changing geopolitical context um, and the yeah the shift in, in power and the, the shift in the rise of, of, of the third world and indigenous peoples. So while it's really devastating to see this AUKUS pact, it's also a sign of their weakness. Uh, of course, we should oppose AUKUS. We should oppose AUKUS because it's a betrayal of the Pacific. Um, Australia and New Zealand are members of the Pacific Islands Forum, which commits us to uh, Pacific-led foreign policy, to finding peaceful solutions to global tensions, and to prioritising climate change as the biggest security risk to the region. This pact re-entrenches colonial old world allegiances. It ramps up militarism in the region, making all of us less safe. Um, and it, it means that it puts a target on us as uh, New Zealand and Australia, um, but that's to say nothing of Kohan, to say nothing of the Philippines, Okinawa, South Korea, and, and every territory unfortunate enough to have a military base, base placed on it. It also goes against the intentions of the Treaty of Rarotonga um, and, and to our commitments to non-proliferation because it, it requires Australia to develop their nuclear cap capabilities. It's obviously incredibly devastating the environmental impact that this could have as it brings us closer to a possible nuclear war and I've been really um, concerned with the normalisation of, of terms like tactical nukes, you know, as if as if we could have a just a, a, a nuclear war that might be um, contained to a battle, battlefield. So AUKUS really is a suicide pact because it is setting up this part of the world as a staging ground for war and it, it's setting up the Pacific as a sacrifice zone and it, it, it relegates our people to collateral uh, here in Australia is really advanced the um, the types of media propaganda that we're seeing. Um, we try to replicate that in New Zealand. We're not quite as successful, but it's it's really kind of cookie cutter stuff. Um, this this idea of Chinese military build up, Chinese aggression, all of these Chinese bases. But when you look at any of the statistics, when you look at when you you know do a simple Google search, you'll you'll discover. That, um, that, that China really poses very little risk, that it is the US that has military bases all across the Pacific. If you look at how many uh, off, uh, overseas military bases China have, they have, depending on how you count, you could say eight, if you can include the little offshore bases that they have created. If you look, um, if you, uh, I saw someone in the audience putting one figure up, that's right. So they only really have one overseas military base. And how many do, do the US have? 800. 800. <laughs> yeah, everybody knows I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. Um, there's also these ideas of, of this being about um, indigenous rights or protecting um, Taiwan or Hong Kong. And it's as an indigenous person, it's ludicrous and um, insulting that, that, this, that we could look at this pact and think that it has anything to do with protecting indigenous peoples. Um, and then, of course, in the media, we're also seeing lots and lots of stories about Chinese interference, about um, intellectual property, and, and any kind of controversy that we can um, see, um, you know, any, any story that says China bad to try to, to create an environment where the Australian public would be willing to support a war on China. So we have to do what we can to oppose those types of nar narratives. So yes, we should absolutely oppose AUKUS. AUKUS. Yes, we should oppose nuclear colonialism, white settlerism, and militarism. But ending militarism and it means first and foremost here in this part of the world ending the genocidal occupation of so-called Australia. It means standing in solidarity with Indigenous Australians and listening politically, and that includes listening to uh, critiques. Uh, of the view of the, uh, the, sorry, critical views of the voice to parliament. So this is not an indigenous led pro process. The federal uh, government gets to dictate the structure of the pro and the process and gets to uh, dictate how indigenous Australians will be represented. They get to choose what the question in the referendum is. And we've heard calls for there to be a treaty before the voice. And, and when people talk about this treaty, they're often uh, referring to the Māori experience in Aotearoa as well. So I want to talk just a little bit about that. So uh, a lot of people probably know that we have Māori seats in Parliament. Um, and to be very clear, those Māori seats were established 
to limit Māori representation. So they were established when, when the settler government first formed, it said that you had to be, you know, you have to be over 21 and male and landholding. But as they began to broke, break up our, our communal land ownership, more and more Māori became eligible to vote. Um, so in order to constrain our political representation, they instituted the Māori seats. So this is the way that our movements get constrained through these types of processes. Uh, we also have our treaty settlements process, which people think is great, but that, of course, was established only in, as a way to try to contain and, and um, you know, diffuse the, the Māori land struggle. So in that process as well, it's not perfect. The Crown dictates tri tribal entities, so how we represent ourselves, our identity and our structure. And we have to sign away our, our rights. We have to say that our, our land claims are extinguished. We have to say that settlements are full and final, which of course they never are. Um, and it converts, this is the most appalling part, I think, is that it converts sovereign nations, sovereign Māori nations, into trusts operating under Pākehā law. So it's a, it's a way of incorporating us into a crown system, uh, incorporating us into a capitalist project it's about some form of recognition so that the Crown is able to say that they've consulted with us. Uh, so it's about sending, uh, setting up these friendly elites that the Crown is able to engage with, um, and therefore it, it provides legitimacy to the, the settler order. So in, in many Māori, like, you know, the process, you know, you could, you could look to the process and see that there have been some benefits that have come out of it, like we've been able to get some very limited compensation for what happened to us. We've had the, the opportunity to develop some forms of leadership through this um, and the strengthening of identity, you could say. But there's also been really strong opposition and resistance to, to these processes, which have been really, really important and continue to be important in pushing our agenda forward. Uh, and our on ongoing struggle towards uh, independence. And so I think this, what, what is required is that we listen really politically when we're talking about the voice to parliament, about all the voices um, of indigenous people in regard to this matter, because you know when we look at it, the, the voice to parliament has a lot more to offer the settler state. It has a lot more to offer white people than it does for indigenous people. It is a way of providing legitimacy to the genocidal project of white sovereignty that's built on indigenous death. It's a very nice opportunity to alleviate settler guilt and to constrain and, and direct the struggle in a particular direction. Um, and so what I'm asking here is I'm, I'm not commenting on whether people should vote yes or no, that's not my place, but my, my job here, I think, is to remind us all that our, our task in this historical moment is to listen politically to Indigenous voices. And I'll, I'll finish by just uh, quoting Chelsea Watego on this matter, who says, uh, what the black reformers have forgotten, because many people have been framing this as a, as a right versus left issue, is that Indigenous sovereignty of the unceded kind can never be reduced to a matter of left or right. It is the settlers to the left and to the right who remain on the same ledger when it comes to undermining Indigenous sovereignty. Both sides of the settler yes-no campaigns reduce Indigenous sovereignty to a matter of service delivery. They aim to ameliorate our conditions and to save us from our supposed despair. That is not the foundation from which we should be negotiating our relationships as First Nations peoples. Black lack and settler benevolence are as much a settler fantasy as terra nullius. We will not be saved, at least not from settlers, we need not be, for we have survived after all. We owe neither side a thing, but we owe ourselves so much more. Kilda. I come from Nam, from Wurundjeri land, unceded, and I'm really very, very pleased to be in, in Mianton and uh, pay my respects to Yagara, Yagara and Turbal. Uh, elders, past and present, and to those who may be here. It's a remarkable uh, development, and it was made very clear to me in the extraordinary fireside meeting we had in the park in the centre of Brisbane last night, uh, for which I'm also very grateful um, to have been part. I'm not going to talk about AUKUS. I think that most people here roughly know what, what's going on with AUKUS, and most of what's going to happen with AUKUS if it happens, it's going to happen quite a, a long way down the road. 
Um, I actually want to talk about something which I think is more immediate, certainly highly relevant to Queensland, um, but is very much a part of what the United States is planning in essentially imperial planning, apropos China, as Arama uh, said very, very clearly, um, and that impacts on what Shinako um, and um, uh, almost all the other speakers have been saying today, um, and particularly Nick in Guahan. Firstly, what's really happening um, is that well, empire is transnational. That's the fundamental. And so we have to be. That's just the way it is. Australians are very bad at recognising that their whole history post-invasion is about integrating to empire. We have little nuances occasionally of wanting a bit of self-reliance, but we're not very good at recognising the depth of our integration uh, into first one empire and now uh, another. What's really remarkable though, and not many people have been paying, I think, enough attention to it in my trade, which is pretty ratty, you know, academics for God's sake, um, and is that the United States has really been working very hard to renovate its alliance system, alliance system which really was pretty unchanged, certainly in this part of the world, from the 50s through until about 10, 15 years ago. Um, and I think now we're seeing this moving very quickly. I think the United States has made three major moves about which all involve Australia and about which Australia and the Albanese government, unfortunately, since it's here at the moment, forget about that horrible man who preceded him, uh, is very enthusiastic. And the first is that the alliance bilateral relationships, Australia, United States, Japan, United States, Republic of Korea, United States, those relationships have been tightened very hard. And in Shinako's case, seeing this very clearly in Okinawa, the, the real center of militarism, uh, American militarism in Japan. But each of those has been tightened. Second, uh, what I call actually global NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization now reaches to the Pacific Ocean. That's a logical step, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And recall that Australia fought under NATO command in Afghanistan for the better part of 20 years. Very deep connection uh, there. Our Prime Minister, together with the Prime Minister, I've, uh, I'm not sure if New Zealand went to NATO this year. Certainly, ah, well, congratulations. Uh, Japan and South Korea went it well. This is a big new political development, not just symbolic. So NATO is now projecting itself into the Pacific and Australia and the Japanese government and the South Korean government and looks like New Zealand want to get into, into NATO in some form or another. So this is a very pretty successful American plan and of course the invasion of Iraq is now the, the vehicle for that because we all know that is code for Taiwan uh, again. So the last thing I want to say here is that, and this is often, again often unnoticed, Australia, for example, now has new bilateral relationships with France, which says it's an Indo-Pacific power with lots of colonial territories. It has a new bilateral relationship with Japan. I think we've I've forgotten what it's called now. It keeps the adjectives keep changing, enhanced, superior, whatever, I don't know. But it is a very it's Japan's second most important defense relationship now. Um, we have an enhanced relationship with India, not a formal American ally, but is pretty close to it. What's more interesting still is France has a relationship, similar relationship to India. So they have reciprocal basing rights throughout the Indian Ocean. Um, Japan has a reciprocal relationship with uh, India. Japan has a reciprocal relationship with France all giving basing rights when you put Australia in the mix all the way through. So that's three big changes from the old hub and spokes uh, model in the Pacific. And Australia is involved in all of them. And Australia, the Australian government is very enthusiastic about this at the moment. So that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing is that that really moves us to um, what you might call, on, on our part, our relationship with the United States and particularly in the region in the Pacific, um, an enhanced relationship with it. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the B-52 deployment coming next year. B-52s are uh, long-range strategic uh, bombers 
In the US Air Force, they come in two types, uh, nuclear capable and on occasion nuclear armed, we presume, and certainly intention tend to be nuclear armed, or non-nuclear. Um, what's really important is the developments that are happening at Tyndall are paralleled by developments in, developments in Guahan, when Guahan has always been a B-52 hub and it's been an appalling kind of uh, impact on that, on that territory. But if I want to say something, I want to say something particularly um, about um, uh, the way that, that that's working. Those of you in Australia will probably know that um, uh, the Rudd-Gillard government formed uh, a, what's called a force posture agreement in 2014 after the meeting between Julia Gillard and Barack Obama that gave us the Marines at uh, Darwin and the US Air Force um, dropping into Northern Australian ports. The force posture agreement is what we little we know about it, gives the United States access to a great many Australian uh, military facilities. We don't know which ones because the government will not release the list, but we certainly know from construction data, um, uh, company X saying, oh, we're part of the Force Posture Agreement initiative, we're building this big new base. So we know about the six, uh, sorry, the 303 million litre fuel, bulk fuel facility at East Arm in Darwin. This is a really big, that's US only, leaving aside the Australian one. Secondly, we know about the construction uh, underway at RAF Darwin, uh, which will have its own US Air Force squadron facility, operating facility. We know the runways are being extended, we know that ammunition dumps are being uh, built larger. And then there's RAF base Tyndall, which is three, 350 kilometres further south of Darwin, out, just outside Catherine. That's currently our biggest base north of Townsville, north of, of Amberley. So it's a strategically important base for Australia. Until now, it's primarily been a fighter base, F-35 um, fighters there now. Morrison committed about a billion and a half dollars to expand uh, the facility, build bigger, longer, stronger runways, the bigger the aircraft, the more you don't want to sink into the sinkholes, which actually they have in the airport uh, there. Um, and then um, Biden has committed under what's called the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, um, spending about half a billion dollars um, on a US only part, a US Air Force only part of Tyndall, which includes a half kilometre long apron to where you can park and house up to six B-52 aircraft or the C-17 transport planes, which are huge planes which come with them. They built their own fuel dump at, uh, at, at Tyndall next to the Australian one, another three million litres. They built a maintenance facility. And it's not just to change grease and change the oil or something like that. This is really big stuff to change engines if you need to. What it amounts to is what I call a fly-in, fly-out base. It's not a, a permanent station. They talk about rotational deployment. But the planes will come from their homes in Louisiana, bases in Louisiana and Minnesota. It takes them about 23 hours to fly here. They'll fly in, do whatever they do, come back to Tyndall and then go home. But 100 or 150 or so American personnel will be there all the time. And this USF Air Force only or dedicated facility is really a very, very big change. Nick pointed out the reason why that the Americans are very aware of how vulnerable um, their facilities on Guahan actually are to the Chinese. So they have this idea, we'll distribute the bases around a bit. I kind of think the Chinese will notice this. You know, I'm not, I may be wrong, but I think they will. So th that's not entirely convincing. What's really important from an Australian point of view are two things. Firstly, while we have actively supported the alliance and or, uh, American strategy uh, by hosting Pine Gap, the most important intelligence facility in the world, by hosting the Space Surveillance Telescope and the Space Surveillance Radar on the Exmouth uh, Peninsula down from Northwest Cape, really important for space warfare. That was essentially surveillance, cooperation, help, a lot of our people at Pine Gap. What deployment of B-52s to Tyndall, whether they're nuclear armed or not, we don't know that, come back to that in a minute. What b what they symbolise is our active involvement in power projection in time of war. 
You can call it deterrence if you want, but there's a point where deterrence either doesn't work or fails and you go into simple war fighting. Australia will supply from Tyndall and also I think from Amberley the fighter aircraft for protection. They, we've built a big new apron of our own at Tyndall for four giant uh, re Australian refuelling aircraft. So every B-52 flying towards Shanghai or Hainan, where the Chinese uh, nuclear submarine bases are, they will, each one will need at least one refuelling aircraft, if not two. And you can do the maths and work out what that actually means there. But we will be contributing directly to that. From Amberley, we will be sending very large uh, airborne early warning and control aircraft. These have fabulous radars and avionics which can see out to about four or five hundred kilometres. That's the protection for the whole system the fighters will then go into action about. So we are providing the shield on, in the air there. The second part of the problem is whether or not those B-52s which will rotate in and out of Tyndall whether they will be nuclear armed or not. Now, we know that the aircraft come, there are about 76 that are active. These are built in the early 60s, but they're still going well, refurbished many times, like the shovel that's had a new handle, a new, and, a new, and a new head, and blah, blah. They're extraordinary instruments of imperial power projection. They, if they are nuclear, well, either the, um, uh, either, nuclear armed or non-nuclear armed, if they're operating from Australia, their role is what the Americans call standoff weapons. These are very old aircraft, upgraded to be sure, but not capable of penetrating modern air defence. What they'll do is fly just about to the edge of the Philippines, somewhere around there, and then they will release their um, air-to-ground missiles. These missiles are either conventional or nuclear, I'll talk about them in a minute, but they're probably from where, well, I think the end of our table here to the, to the, um, the, the wall over there. In the case of the nuclear version, we don't know where the nuclear ones are coming, but we certainly think that nuclear capable ones are going to come because there's no, the government will refuse to say anything about it, despite David's best efforts to um, harass them about it. How dare I ask? <laughs> and, um, <coughs> They, the nuclear missiles, or the, the nuclear capable B 52s, will carry 20 long range uh, air, to, um, air to ground, air launch cruise missiles. Long range means they'll launch 2,000, 2,500 kilometres away from their targets. Now, theoretically, that's safe for the Americans to do that. They, can, they think they can survive that. I suspect my military colleagues in Indonesia might have something to say about the use of Indonesian airspace without uh, consent, but that's another matter. What's really important, though, is that if you were a Chinese general on one of those bases on Hainan or the South China Sea looking at your air defence radar and you see a swarm of B-52s coming up from Tyndall, you have no way of knowing whether they're conventionally armed or nuclear armed. And I have a suspicion that if I was a Chinese general, I'd probably make a fairly conservative guess because the American nuclear superiority over China in general is massive, just truly massive. So that's a danger for Australia uh, in its own right. What's really important to know is that those nuclear capable uh, uh, aircraft will be carrying 20 what are called AGM-86B. 86B, AGM-86B are the nuclear version of cruise missiles which have been around for a long time. The conventional ones have actually gone. These, as I said, will be launched from about 2,000 kilometres away, protected by an Australian shield. Each of those uh, AGM-86B missiles, they have uh, a nuclear warhead on them, the w W80D, I think, from memory. And these have what are called dial a yield. You can have a big yield, about the size of Hiroshima's, the attack on Hiroshima, or a larger yield, about 10 times the size, from 10 to 150 kilotons. The point about that, multiply that by 20, and you get some idea of the word Holocaust uh, involved. And just in case you think the B-52 non-nuclear weapons are something 
that we don't have to care very much about. Back in the days of Vietnam, when they were dropping dumb bombs out of B-52s, the descriptions of what it was like on the ground and the number of US observers and later Vietnamese observers who talked for about a square or two square kilometres from the bomb load from each one. I don't know how far that is in, in, in Brisbane terms, but just in that, was literally hell on earth. Nothing survived there. Nowadays, the weapons are, well, better, if there is such a term, but certainly much more sophisticated. Either way, we have put ourselves deliberately in the front line of an attack on China. We have, in particular, elevated nuclear risk, I think, well, to the region, putting it mildly, certainly to China, and certainly, I think, to us. And so this is where David comes in, because David was uh, confronting the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Penny Wong, and the Secretary of the Department of Defence, Greg Moriarty, in February in Senate Estimates Committee, and very rudely, or firstly, your colleague was rude, St uh, St uh, uh, Jordan Steele John, mm -hmm. asking whether there were nuclear-capable aircraft coming to Australia, and Penny Wong, you know, who's pretty, usually gives the impression of being a pretty cool character, essentially lost it. Um, and you can never tell with politicians, I'm sorry, David, whether they're doing it deliberately or not. No, no, she was cranky. Um, <laughs> well, she was certainly cranky by the time she got to you because you came on 15 minutes later and after Moriarty gave a prepared statement, um, in the essence of which was uh, that, uh, as, she, as he and then Wong said, Australia understands and respects the American doctrine of neither confirming nor denying the, abs the presence of nuclear weapons on um, uh, aircraft entering Australia. That's a doctrine going back to the 1950s. Very few exceptions to it. David Longy got sent to the, the, the naughty room uh, for doing it in New Zealand. What's really interesting is that despite um, the questioning from the two Green Senators, and David's particularly dogged pushing, it was really extraordinary. Wong not only presented this fairly ridiculous, oh, humiliating understanding and respecting the American doctrine, she worked very hard to avoid anything from your question using the words nuclear capable. Yep. It was quite startling. And if you, I urge you to read the transcript, or I'm writing about it, and something will come out shortly, but look at the video. It's really revealing because Wong is a serious performer. Um, and I kind of have always thought that if you take the position of Foreign Minister of Australia, you understand, and particularly if you're a Labor Foreign Minister, at some stage you are going to be utterly humiliated by the Americans. It's kind of standard uh, practice, I suspect. But she was really, and I think that's what I just said, she was rattled by it. So I think there's a vulnerability there. It's not at all unreasonable to ask whether the aircraft will be nuclear capable. Half of them will be, half of them won't be. We now know how to distinguish them uh, with Vince Scapatura at Macquarie University. We're constructing a very robust data uh, uh, base about this. It's going to be possible to visually identify them. If foreign affairs had a spine, they would want to do it anyway for, well, quite simply, nuclear safety reasons. Because under the Treaty of Rarotonga, each member state of the, of the Treaty of Rarotonga, that, which established the South Pacific Nuclear Weaponry Zone, is free to decide for itself whether it will allow visits by nuclear armed uh, ships or aircraft. Now, if the government, as the government often says, and I think said in reply to David, oh, but there are no nuclear armed uh, weapons coming on, on the ships. Well, the reason there's no nuclear weapons coming on American Navy ships is that George Bush, the elder, the, the older, less stupid one, uh, in 1991, took all tactical nuclear weapons off American warships. Yep. So it wasn't any achievement. But that allowed her to not say anything about the question that David was asking about, about the aircraft. So we really need to be pushing the government very hard on this question. Um, we also need to be thinking out, well, if there are actually nuclear armed aircraft to coming to Australia, what on earth is the government doing about it? Forget the discussions about AUKUS and you know, the dreadful things that might happen in ports in the East Coast when we get nuclear submarines, because that's a way down the line. What on earth are we going to be doing if there is some kind of accident um, at, uh, at Tyndall? You don't have, I mean, these things happen. They do. I'll finish by saying we can ask this of the government, 
because we know an earlier Australian government bullied the United States into allowing a variation of neither confirm nor deny. Malcolm Fraser, who those of you who are older uh, will remember, in 1980, following the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, was very worried about the spread of Soviet power in, in, the, uh, in Central Asia and the Indian Ocean. Not entirely foolishly, I think. Um, but the Americans knocked on the door and said, can we have training flights, low level terrain avoidance navigation training flights? And then, he, and he said, yes, you can come. A year later, they knocked on the door again and said, well, we'd also like to bring some to land at Darwin so we can send them out over the Indian Ocean past Diego Garcia towards um, uh, the edge of Africa where the, we're very worried about Soviet naval activity. Um, can we do that? Fraser said yes to both, but he put conditions on it which have never been paralleled, to my knowledge, anywhere else in the American Imperium. He said, first of all, you must openly say and allow us to say that they are unarmed and carry no bombs. I mean, thank God they were unarmed, carrying no bombs, because what they were doing was hurtling over Cape York and Arnhem Land when they, and then coming down to about 500 or even 300 feet, 100 metres. What's 100 metres around here? It's pretty tall buildings around here. They're well over 100 metres. And they're coming at 600 kilometres an hour, and they're practising staying as low as possible. Good thing they didn't have nuclear weapons on board or even conventional weapons. But Fraser got that out of them. And I've just been reading the American command histories from, from um, SYNCPAC from Hawaii from that time. They admitted secretly that they weren't wild about it, but it resulted from Fraser's negotiations. So other things followed from that. The point is if one Australian Prime Minister can get a measure of accountability and a measure of transparency, why can't a Labor government? I'll finish there. When we're talking about issues of defence and military protection, acknowledging the invasion of this continent, acknowledging ongoing First Nations sovereignty, acknowledging global Indigenous resistance, I think is critical. I, I travelled here from my home on Gadigal land, um, but we have a huge obligation, I think, to ensure that we deliver that measures of self-determination and sovereignty and respect of um, Indigenous resistance and First Nations resistance on this land. Um, so we're here to talk about, this panel is, AUKUS, what does it mean for Australia in the Asia Pacific? Well, I suppose I might just first of all talk about what I think it kind of unmasks for, uh, in relation to the Australian body politic. And the first thing I think it unmasks is just how undemocratic it is how none of this was taken to the Australian people. None of it was even taken to the Australian Labor Party. Um, and definitely none of it has been taken to the parliament. Um, and, and so how is it that we find ourselves enmeshed in what will be a multi-generational arms slash industrial slash military arrangement with the United States and the UK without any of that happening, without a democratic mandate, without even an internal discussion within the ruling political party, in this case, the Labor Party, uh, and absolutely without a discussion in Parliament. Well, I, th I think the reason is that that's how it's always been done. And, and that's a kind of frightening conclusion to have about it. We, we have... I, I, I sit in that parliament, I sit in the Senate, you watch the kind of decision making that happen, that happens and and on these critical for the for the in the eyes of the club, for these critical decisions, they will not trust the parliament and they certainly don't trust the Australian people. They 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 because they, I think they have a sneaking suspicion that if they ask the Australian people, how do you feel about dropping three, four, five hundred billion dollars on nuclear submarines, cutting down on education expenditure and enmeshing us in the US military and increasing our likelihood of a nuclear conflict with China. How do you feel about that? Um, I think they get a sense that there might be a resounding no from the Australian people. So they don't ask. But the fact that they don't have to ask 
the fact that they don't have to ask should make us really reflect upon how power is exercised in our democratic system in Australia because it is exercised by a small club, largely of men, not all of men, um, largely men, in both the military, um, in senior executive positions, in the Defence Department and Foreign Affairs, Prime Minister and Cabinet and Treasury, and in a kind of rotating small group that self-selects from the coalition and Labor. They don't trust their own parties, they don't trust their own parliament, and they don't trust the Australian people, and they retain that power in, 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 the, in that tight club and do everything they can to resist scrutiny of it. It is quite remarkable to watch it up close. It is quite remarkable to watch it up close. And, and they are furious when it's called out. So, what, what does it actually... So, so I think if we start from that point, that it's not a democratic decision, and they didn't pretend it's a democratic decision, I think it makes it easier to work out how to try and derail it, and it also makes it, it, makes it a more clear-eyed analysis of what AUKUS actually is. So let's start with it not being democratic. Let's start with it coming from the usual power bases, the sort of industrial military complex and its friends within government and corporate Australia and, 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 and the US, and also you know, their, um, their, uh, their cheer squad in, in parts of corporate and government-funded academia. Let, let's accept that. And let's have a real look at it. So Richard Miles, who I don't think has much intellectual play in this, um, definitely very little clear personal agency in the, in the thing. He's playing his role. He's, he's really just playing the role. And it's the role that any defence minister would play if they don't want to push against the club. So his role is largely to cheer on what defence are telling him. Um, to try and articulate it in a positive way that try and sell it to the Australian public, but to think that Richard Miles is actually, you know, a, an, a, an actual independent player and agent in this, I think, falls into that 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 mistake of thinking that because he's the elected minister, he must have some actual democratic power. He doesn't really. He's just playing his role, which is the 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 spokes the spokesperson for the. Um, for, for the defence industry. But he said his, his contribution, if you can call it that, was he wants Australia to have the capacity to deliver impactful projection. And at the time he said it, everybody said, well, what does that mean? Where did you come? Where did you get, where did you get that from? You know, did you read it on the back of your cereal packet? What does it actually mean? Impactful projection. It means impactful projection. But it's actually part of the overall shift that we've seen in the public rhetoric from defending Australia to actually threatening our neighbours and our near neighbours. Hmm. And, and that's impactful projection is Richard Miles' kind of trite, pathetic two-word slogan to say, actually, we're no longer talking about defending Australia. We're not going to pretend we've got a defence of continental Australia as our strategy. Our actual strategy is to, uh, side by side with our most recent great and powerful friend, to be able to threaten our neighbours and particularly threaten China and deliver some kind of threatening lethal force into the South China Sea. He calls it impactful projection. That's, that's the big shift. That's the meta shift in their narrative. And what they say is the only way to keep Australia safe is to threaten our neighbours. Um, the only way that we can protect continental Australia in this new global conflict that they want to talk about is to be able to threaten large-scale lethal force in the South China Sea, largely. And that's how you keep Australia safe, um, in their eyes. So that's what, that's the meta-narrative shift that we're hearing, and that's what they're selling. Um, and, and that's, you know, where the AUKUS sub-deal comes from. And the AUKUS sub-deal is designed for us really to, to I think, subsidise the US and the UK military, and particularly to save the UK nuclear industrial base for their submarine base, their, their submarine um, uh, industry, by saying, we'll buy a big chunk of the next generation of UK submarines, which will make it marginally achievable for the UK to roll out its new class of submarines. Don't you worry, we're here. 
we'll drop a couple of hundred billion dollars of Australian taxpayers' money to bail out the UK um, submarine industry. But it's good for the US too, because this new platform will have all of US um, uh, weapon-based weapon systems on it, and we'll have a US nuclear propulsion unit. So we'll also be helping out the US corporate military industry as well. But that's us. We offered to do that. And um, um, through initially Morrison, but then of course through Albanese. And I, I don't know about you, but earlier this year, I went to bed worried about a $200 billion nuclear submarine problem. And I woke up to images of some 80 year old US president, Albanese and, and um, the UK prime minister telling us about a $368 billion problem. Well, actually, in truth, they didn't say that. They backgrounded media on it the night before to try and transition the public's mind. And in fact, Richard Miles has never said it's a $368 billion program. He refuses to put a price on it. Um, they, they talk about it as a proportion of GDP because they don't want to put a price on it because they know it's going to be obscenely more expensive than $368 billion. But I, yeah, I went to bed with a $200 billion problem and I woke up with a $368 billion problem. The more I look at it, I realize it's actually probably a half to $1 trillion problem that we're going to have in terms of nuclear submarines. And that is designed to be part of impactful projection for us to be our loyal little sub-imperial unit, self-funding sub-imperial unit that can help project force into the South China Sea, actively designed to drag us into a conflict, actively designed to do that. Not to make Australia safe, not to defend continental Australia, but consciously designed to drag us into a conflict, um, and particularly here with China. And it's part of the second part of the public debate shift that we're seeing. Delivered by Albanese, delivered by Penny Wong, delivered by Richard Miles, delivered by the coalition, delivered by the, the, um, the Nine Facts media, delivered by News Corp, which is we are moving into an inevitable global conflict with China. And that's the second part of the cell that they're doing. Um, the Chinese regime is inevitably going to expand. They're threatening to break the international rules-based order. Um, and by breaking, we, we have to defend the international rules-based order against this rising dangerous power. And that's why we'll be there side by side with the United States involving ourselves in a regional, potentially global nuclear conflict to defend the rules-based order. Well, of course, as we all know, the rules-based order is defended by those who set the rules, isn't it? And that's the idea that, it's, yes, it is a rules-based order, but it's, it's, it's the US's rules and the UK's rules. And it's, it's no wonder that other parts of the world don't much like the rules-based order because there wasn't some sort of global conference where they said, what should the rules look like? What's a fair way of, of, de of delivering resources and power and access and influence on this planet? How do we do it fairly? And the US and the UK said, sure, we'll give you some nice fair rules. That's not what happened. We acknowledge that the international rules-based order has been set by global European and, and North American empires to favor them. And it's no wonder that other countries push back against it. But we are there as a loyal little sub-imperial power defending the rules-based order. And the good news from a US perspective is we're willing to pay for it ourselves. We're willing to pay for it ourselves. And isn't that great? And, and look, I do, I'm sure many of you would have read it, but I think Clinton Fernandez's recent deconstruction of that role of a sub-imperial power, I think it's, his book is called Sub-Imperial Power, um, is a really useful, for me, clarifying tool to give to friends and colleagues so you want to get a quick, you know, 200-page insight into, into how that plays out. And I, I'd, 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 um, I'd, I'd recommend it to people. But that's what we're involved in, this sort of conscious shift of the public debate, away from defending Australia, into projecting power, and the second part of that is we have to do that because there's this inevitable conflict with China. Both of those things are dangerous lies, of course, deeply dangerous lies, and, I, and, I, and, 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 and we could unpick those lies. But that's the narrative that they're desperately trying to deliver. But why don't we just have a look at what some, I think, the pressure points are in this, in this campaign. And I'll just go through four. There's probably more. But I'll go through what I think are four current pressure points 
for the AUKUS deal that we should all think about helping out and, and organising against. The first is to get the AUKUS to get the AUKUS submarine project up and running, they need an east coast base. And there's really only one rational east coast base that they can choose, which is Port Kembla, just south of my hometown um, 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 in, um, in New South Wales, just south of Sydney. Just It's the, it's the main port that services uh, Wollongong and Illawarra. Port Kembla is a really tiny port. Um, it's only a couple of hundred metres across. Um, and the people of the Illawarra are really excited about what Port Kembla can be for them. They are really excited about having it as a green energy export hub. They have a huge industrial base there. They want to turn the, the existing steel works into a green steel works, um, powered by offshore wind and other renewable energy grid infrastructure that's happening in and around Port Kembla. It's one of five renewable energy hubs that's been identified by, this, by the New South Wales government. They are super excited about what Port Kembla can be. And they've been building this project locally with unions, with local councils, with local, local business for about a decade and a half. And on top of that, Port Kembla is in the Illawarra, which has a huge history of anti-war activism, anti-nuclear activism. That's the port where the MUA and other unions refused to load steel, scrap steel to go to Japan to fuel Japan's imperial war in China. That's the port where there was active opposition to loading um, um, materials to go to fight the, the US imperial war in Vietnam. That's the place that they chose, Labor and before them the coalition, have chosen to put a nuclear, um, a, a nuclear submarine port. Well, good luck with that. Good luck with that. Because if, if they take it any concrete step further, they're, they're going to have a genuine grassroots continuing building grassroots revolt on that. Because they know that if you whack in to Port Kembla, a really little port, they know if you whack in a nuclear submarine base, there's no room for their renewable energy industry. There's no room for a hydrogen export hub. There's no room for the green revolution that is actually the future of the Illawarra. And they are bloody furious about it. And so what has Labor done? It said, oh, well, we're not going to make a decision on that for a decade. We'll keep going down a five, six, seven hundred billion dollar acquisition program on nuclear subs, but we won't say where they will be for another decade. That shows how deeply troubled Labor is. And if they can't get that base off the ground, there's nowhere really on the East Coast to put these things. And they know that that's a world of pain for them. And so we should be working wherever we can with our colleagues in Port Kembla to oppose that and, and the Illawarra. Secondly, the US Congress. In the last, about a month ago, the first signs of resistance came out of the US Congress. They've been confirmed in the last like 48 hours. We've seen 25 US Congress um, uh, reps, um, including, I think, the chair of one of their key um, uh, uh, military oversight committees, say that they're not willing to sign on to handing over to Australia which is part of the AUKUS deal, um, three to five of their own nuclear subs from the 2030s to the 2040s. Now, that, that opposition is coming from a really toxic place in the US because they want to have those nuclear submarines themselves and they're saying to Biden, you have to whack in a whole lot of extra money to guarantee the production of even more nuclear submarines if we're going to agree to give some to, the, to Australia. The Biden, the Biden administration doesn't want to do that, but good news because Anthony Albanese has already committed three billion Australian dollars to expanding the US nuclear sub-building industry, but they know that's not gonna be enough to produce the kind of numbers that they want, and that resistance is real and growing. And interestingly, the kind of embarrassed response that the Biden administration has been backgrounding people on is saying, don't worry about it. Don't worry if they're Australian or the United States, don't worry, because Australia will do what we tell them. If we're having a conflict with Taiwan, Australia will come in like a good little loyal ally. They'll be where, there when we need them because that's what they always do. Don't worry that they haven't got an American flag on it. It's as good as because they're Australian. That's the backgrounding. And in fact, some of the reporting is, actually, you better be quiet about this because the Australian public won't like that. And that's the discussion. That's a pretty toxic place for the US. I think there's a chance that that may unravel. Third one is internally within Labor. 
So we are seeing opposition and growing opposition within Labor. The problem, of course, is within the Labor Party, the Parliamentary Labor Party is not bound by what the, the, the membership and the branches determine. But if that gets to a totally critical point, and probably the next few months is when it's going to be critical before they start all circling around to protect Labor in the upcoming federal election. But in the next couple of months, if that gets to a critical point, it may make it very bloody hard for Labor to hold on to it. And we should, we should acknowledge the work that's happening within Labor and some of the union movement. And I think they're different locuses of power. Um, and, and, and I think we should do all we can to support particularly some of those Labor affiliated unions and non-Labor affiliated unions in the work they're doing to avoid, to, to oppose August. And lastly, I think the public is getting a growing anxiety about the war rhetoric. I think it's building, it's nowhere near there yet, but the arguments are all in favour of pulling out of AUKUS in the, in, in, in the public's mind. They're anxious about war rhetoric, they're anxious about the expense, they're anxious about the opportunity costs, they're anxious about being part of a nuclear, uh, global nuclear industry, they're anxious about where the waste is going to go, and there's no answer on any of that from the Albanese government. So I think we can win this, even though we're not going to win it through a simple vote in parliament, and even though we're fighting undemocratic forces. Um, but I think we've got a big struggle on our hands, and I think we should start by acknowledging where this decision is made and not pretend that we're actually fighting a democratic fight. We're fighting much more traditional opponents using much more uh, brutal, nasty, traditional methods. Thanks very much.